Boy. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Amy Oliver, and uh, I am. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Bertha. Um, welcome to Lucky Thirteen, <laughs> the thirteenth uh, episode of the VCCA Fireplace Series. Um, I am really happy to be here to introduce uh, three um, incredible VCCA fellows and to make a few announcements. Uh, to tell you a little bit about the fire, the, uh, firehouse series, um, this is our attempt to bring, bring fellows together and those who are interested in what we do uh, to, it, it, in a kind of reference to the gatherings that would happen after dinner uh, around the fireplace on the VCCA campus at Mount St. Angelo. So, so this, this was the brainchild of the, um, uh, the VCCA virtual task force who, who just embraced, embraced each other virtually to try and, and figure out how we can be together uh, during this time of social isolation. So uh, um, this series runs every other Thursday evening at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, uh, please uh, feel free to, um, to make questions in the comments uh, after each artist. And... Um, uh, and if you have any questions about the program, all of these uh, programs are archived uh, through Facebook Live and through our YouTube channel. So um, uh, from there, I will start before I introduce everybody um, to take care of a tiny bit of business. So um, so I'm an artist and I'm uh, the current liaison uh, for the executive committee of the VCCA Fellows Council. And the Fellows Council is a, is a group of fellows uh, from every background and part of the country and across the globe. And we are the liaison between the fellows and the VCCA Board of Directors. And we have a call for nominations at present um, that we are going to extend due to all of the excitement and energy and uh, attention that's been given to the current, you know, news and state of the world. So our deadline for nominations to uh, be a part of the VCCA Fellows Council has been extended to November 20th. So if you are interested in being more involved with the VCCA, please take uh, the time to visit uh, vcca.com and learn more about the Fellows Council. And I would like to say that that um, it is not uh, the kind of um, our, our, the Fellows Council does meet regularly, but we do not meet on site. We have virtual meetings, uh, so you can live anywhere and and participate in the conversation. And everybody, you know, people generally uh, have expertise, and they dedicate their expertise. Um, to the diverse array of topics that we um, that we've taken on as our mission. So, uh, thank you for uh, being here and uh, to to hear the work of um, the three fellows that are presenting tonight. And uh, we have um, Karen um, Bonderchuk, uh, Jack Curtis Dubowski, and Lenore Hart. Um, Jack is a composer, Karen is a visual artist, and Lenore is a writer. All three have uh, some very interesting projects that they're going to be talking about tonight. And, um, and uh, sharing their, their work with you. Uh, so uh, first, I believe we're going to be looking at the work of uh, Karen. And uh, Karen is a Canadian artist, uh, but she lives and works in the United States. 
She's had three BCCA residencies in Amherst since 2011, as well as residencies at New Line F in Ovilar and uh, as well as in Salzburg. Uh, she's exhibited her drawing and sculpture work widely in the United States, as well as in Canada, England, France, Italy, and India. Um, Karen was on sabbatical from Western Michigan University, where she was a professor in the Frostick School of Art when the COVID-19 pandemic broke out. This brought an abrupt halt to her research uh, she had planned to do at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Um, and she uh, was forced to shift focus to migrating her teaching to, fully online, to a fully online platform. And she's adapted her studio practice away from her pre-sabbatical work to a series called Bread and the Bone. Oh, I'm sorry. So from Bread and the Bone to a new series called Lost and Found. And she's going to be talking about both of these uh, series tonight and showing us examples of her work. Um, welcome, Karen. Uh, thank you thank for you. Um, sharing your work with us. Thank you, Amy. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and screen as a full screen so that you can see the images a little bit better. So as Amy mentioned, I'm going to talk about two different bodies of work tonight, uh, both of which I've been working on for the past four years or so. Um, and as she mentioned, I've had to kind of make a transition from one body to the other. And so the work in, in uh, both series has been uh, largely uh, inspired by my ongoing interest in corvids, birds in the corvid family. Um, but I've also diverged from that path and I've been testing some different waters um, within that, that scope of, of work. So I have a kind of fascination with the idea of what we leave behind, um, the traces of an existence, be it an existence, be it our existence or the existence of other creatures. Um, and so the physical records of a life having been lived. So ironically, uh, both these bodies of work are vicariously connected to both my residency at uh, Ovilar in, um, in France in 2012. And it brought me right through to my residency in uh, Salzburg, Austria last, uh, last fall with uh, residencies at the VCCA in Amherst in between. And the connection there was actually with a material, which I want to give a shout out. I don't know if she's here tonight, Ellen Kozak, who I had the great pleasure of sharing time and space with at um, Ovilar. And she uh, traveled with these wonderful gessoed panels, uh, which she couldn't take back to the United States with her because her suitcase was too heavy. So me being the scavenger that I am, I scooped the panels up. And I've actually been working with that gesso ever since she shared her recipe with me, which I'm eternally grateful for. And so it led to uh, several bodies of work. And the, the one that um, you're looking at here now is the one called Bread and the Bone. Uh, and so this work was mostly inspired by the evolutionary connections between present day birds and their dinosaur antecedents. And I'm really interested in the biological connections, but also in some of the sort of more poetic uh, and ephemeral connections between uh, past and present. So in this particular instance with this drawing, it's called Bread and the Bone Number Three, Mind the Gap. And uh, the background there is actually from the Blitz in London, which connects to my own family history. Uh, my mother grew up in England during World War II and experienced the Blitz as a little girl. And so I was really interested in this connection to past and present, but also to the material because limestone actually has uh, fossils within it. So it is, um, you know, the remains of marine creatures and fossilized carapaces. And so I was really interested in this idea of being able to sort of dig into the material. So this is actually pigmented inks and charcoal on the gesso, but I'm just gonna zoom in here a little bit if I can and show you that these are actually carved into the gesso. So it gives you an idea of the kind of work that um, I've been exploring in this series. 
Whoops. So uh, this next piece uh, is called uh, Bread and the Bone Number 7, Mobius Dick. And it obviously is making an allusion to uh, Melville's Moby Dick. And I was uh, fascinated by the connection between cetaceans and artiodactyls. So there, um, uh, there's this little creature, which is pictured here, and I have a detail of it um, in just a second. And uh, it's called Indahias. And so Indahias is this in incredible little link that uh, is a, a long since extinct creature. It's about the size of a cat, um, but it actually connects uh, whales to artiodactyls in this really fascinating way. And it was sort of a fluke that when this creature was found, it was actually its inner ear, which is the inner ear of a whale that connected it to whales um, but it also has some of the aspects of bovines and bovids. So I'm really interested in that past and present connection. But again, the kind of poetic coming in here with, you know, you can see the Pequod in the background from Moby Dick and, uh, you know, the ship's wheel, which is also a kind of wheel of life in, in Buddhism. And so this is a detail of Indahias here. You can see uh, in the, the bottom of the screen there. And again, you know, inscribing and carving into the gesso to get my imagery. Um, this is a work called uh, Bread and the Bone Visionary. And I was just really playing with this idea of, uh, you know, predator and prey and the, the sort of cosmic connections between rabbits and corvids, um, both of which have constellations, which I've done some work around. And just this, this kind of notion of connectivity between creatures. In this particular panel, you actually get a, a recipe for rabbit stew in French, uh, ragout de lapin. And so I was kind of playing with this idea of just, again, those sort of whimsical uh, and ethereal connections between these creatures. This is a, a piece that I did uh, last fall actually while I was in Salzburg and it was inspired by the, uh, the puti that were at the Salzburg Cathedral. So these, these chubby little puti that are, are really everywhere within the cathedral. And uh, I, I was really, enjoying this idea of, so I was doing research while I was in, in Austria. So I went into Germany and went to the Missal fossil pits and I discovered at Darmstadt at the museum there in Darmstadt, Germany, this uh, long since extinct flightless bird called Gastornis. And that's what's pictured here in this piece called Time Out of Time. And I was really just playing with connecting the two together. You'll notice in the background, there's patterning and there's subtle patterning in all these pieces. And it actually comes from toilet paper. So I, <laughs> before the pandemic broke out, I was collecting toilet paper for its really interesting patterns that it creates with the ink on the gesso. So I actually use it as a, a pattern template and I've been using paper toweling and things like that. So um, I'm uh, using that just as a way to create pattern and depth and layering in these images. This is another piece in that same series, and this is called Shadow Relations. And this is, a, again, that connection between um, bovids and cetaceans. So we've got dolphins in the background and uh, a chamois in the foreground. And these are found throughout Austria. And this was a particularly beautiful skeleton that I saw at the uh, Natural History Museum while I was in, in Salzburg. So the pandemic broke out about three months after I got back from Europe. And I, I really found it uh, difficult to focus after, after the pandemic broke out. I, I just really, uh, my research came to a halt. I was supposed to be in Washington at the Smithsonian doing more research um, and learning actually uh, to do uh, bony constructions with a sculptor friend of mine. And uh, that all came to a screeching halt. And I had been doing this other series for the last year or two called Lost and Found. And it's a, a kind of an homage to my ongoing love of 
uh, scavenged items of found objects. So I have this great collection of junk and garbage in my studio of rusty metal and bottle caps and different things. And so I started to play with bringing these uh, physical objects together with these birds. And so um, all of the birds in this series are corvids. And this one, of course, was done after the pandemic broke out. So uh, it's called Breathing Space. And the bird obviously is wearing its mask and its ma and its gloves on its feet. And, and so the, the object above is actually uh, a real hole in the panel. So I, I've been playing with the, the object suggesting the bird, the bird suggesting the object. Sometimes I start off by just staining panels en masse in this kind of non-objective way. And the work just kind of tells me where it needs to go. It's been the kind of work that I've needed to do because I've found it so difficult to really get back to the focused work that I was doing with the Bread and the Bone series. So again, you know, this one's called Poseur and this idea of, you know, posing or posturing. And so much of this, again, is the kind of interplay between the background and the foreground, between the bird, what gets suggested by the bird. And, uh, and with uh, this particular piece, something in the air, everything started to look like COVID-19 to me. So, you know, it was kind of this, uh, you know, when you're a, a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And, and that's what kind of started to happen with the work. So I just have kind of gone with that and let the work be very playful and not thought about it too much. So thinking about the things that crows collect, the things that I collect, and my connection to those amazingly intelligent creatures. And so this is the last piece that I'm gonna show this evening. Um, it's called Infinity. And, uh, you know, sometimes I just find what I find to be beautiful garbage. And it's, it's got patina, it's got history, it's got life. And it, that for me is really the passion for me in the work is finding that life in these objects and finding the meaning and the subtlety and the nuances between the debris of our lives, you know, what remains, what we leave behind and what we find in this world. And that is my presentation. Wow, thank you. <laughs> That that was that was um, fascinating. Um, I I love um, the the history that you reference in your work, not just in the imagery, but also the history of the surfaces that you create, as well as the things that you bring into that that um, picture plane with with your uh, your collection. Um, uh, if there's a lot of different things to think about it. Uh, we, I think we're going to be doing most of our questions at the end, but I did have a, a, a question from Lenore about your corvids. And, uh, uh, you know, how did you become intrigued by them? She, how did you become intrigued with using them? Yeah, so I think it was about 15 years ago, I, I started seeing scraps of tires on the sides of the highway. And, you know, I've always been like a junk and garbage collector. And I started thinking about the material and, and I thought, wow, that's a great material. Because here in Michigan, of course, being in the center of the automobile industry, we've got all this debris on the sides of the roads because we're in Michigan and it's automobile central and it's the sides of the highways. So I actually started collecting that material because it started to remind me of dead birds when I saw it in the distance laying on the road. And I started making big dead crows out of scraps of tires. And that's where that fascination started. But then I started doing research on crows and ravens and birds in the corvid family. So rooks and jackdaws and blue jays. And I was blown away. I, they are so amazingly intelligent they have the brain capacity of a primate in terms of their ability to think sequentially, they're able to use tools. So, you know, really that, that fascination came out of material and exploring material, but then it really got cemented when I started to research them and discovered that I'm actually a lot like a crow. <laughs> so. That's 
fascinating. I, I think yeah. one one uh, silver lining of this bizarre period in history is that the birds and the bees really love it. Nature has had a respite, and I am happy for that. Let's be grateful for things like that. Absolutely. Uh, um. So. Uh, so we will uh, next. I'm going to um, introduce Jack, and then we were gonna. We'll have a, a hopefully enough time at the end to introduce questions from everywhere. Um, hi, Jack. Hi. Um, so uh, Jack has done two residencies at, at the VCCA uh, in 2009 and 2012, and. Um, he is somebody that probably met a lot of great people around the fireplace when you were there because he's a composer, author, filmmaker. Um, he works in concert music, improvisation, and live performance. Um, his work serves the LGBTQ um, and other communities um, where he lives. His, uh, he's a, has a book, he's also a, a writer, Intersecting Film, Music, and Queerness. It bridges musicology, cinema studies, and queer theory. Um, another, his other book is Easy Listening and Film Scoring, 1948 to 1978. Oh, and that's that's forthcoming. That is going to be on uh, Leah Rutledge. Um, and that's an interesting time for the book, the publishing industry, but that's a conversation we can have at the end. Um, uh, Dubowski produced and directed the experimental documentary Submerged Queer Spaces, which is streaming on Amazon. It examines architecture and gentrification. Um, his archive is held in the special collections at the Ovadi Library at California State University in Northridge. It includes his scores, 500 hours of recordings, and 100 hours of video. Um, he has created choral music such as Harvey Milk, a cantata, which emphasizes social justice. Um, his concert music employs acoustic instruments, composed material, and uh, structured improvisation. Yeah, I like that structured improvisation. Um, the Jack Curtis Dabowski Ensemble has played theaters and performance spaces nationwide, presenting live scores to silent and experimental film. Um, F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu was the last show the ensemble performed before the lockdown in February 2020 at the Vista Theater in LA. Wow, how uh, serendipitous with Nosferatu. Are we going to hear any of that tonight? Yes, that's what I'll be playing are oh, cool. some themes from the Nosferatu score, our Nosferatu score. How oh, cool. Okay, should I take it away? Yes, we are, we are excited. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, you may have seen Nosferatu. Um, and so Nosferatu begins with some happy times with Hooter and Ellen, who have this wonderful relationship together. So the film starts with happy times. And so this is a little uh, theme for the happy times at the beginning of the film. <laughs> So then um, Ellen, who's the, the leading lady of the film, um, Hooter goes away and Ellen's often sad. So there's a variation of this theme for uh, sad Ellen. Thank you. 
So there's a lot in Nosferatu that's sort of mysterious and unknown. So there's a lot we don't know as we move through the film. So there's a little theme we have for the unknown. And of course, like any good film, there's chases. And so we have a little scherzo, which is good for the chases. So we have when the villagers chase Nock, um, who they think is a bad guy. And when uh, the Count is racing to get to Wisborg, we have this little scherzo. I'll try to play this. Okay. <laughs> can just keep rolling and rolling and going on while various players hit various actions and characters. Um, we also have an illness theme because um, illness is one of the major themes of Nosferatu. Um, the film is set during the plague in Wisborg, so it seems strangely apropos for right now. And um, throughout the film, there's references to illness um, and the plague. And so we have this theme. And um, so Count Orlock is a very interesting character in the film. And he's a more complex uh, creature than you have in later versions of Dracula. So uh, for Count Orlock, I wrote this very sort of um, formal, grand, majestic theme because he's a count, he's royalty, he's very formal. Um, but still there's something about him that's not quite right.
and then I have one last theme to play. Um, and this uh, theme um, incorporates one little bit of public domain music, which is from the original score by Hans Erdmann. Um, and this is the death theme. And you may recognize the first eight bars of this um, if you've seen the film with the original score from there's a long shot of a street in Wisborg and there's a parade of coffins with pallbearers that are going down the street and it's a very impressive long shot and gives you the sense of the scale of the plague. So the first eight bars of this are from um, Hans Erdmann's um, original theme from 1927 which has since fallen into the public domain and the rest of the music is is by me um, but so here this is our death theme uh, for Nosferatu. And there you go. How did I do with time? It well, that was uh, that was powerful. Oh, thank uh, you. I, I really uh, the, uh, the 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 um, the 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 dirge at the end, I think, was really struck me as well as the one that the music that referred to the unknown. You know, it just the I think it was the third the, the third bit that you play um uh and i've seen nosferatu several times i saw it with live music and uh the original score but it's been a while and to see it now with the world in its current state would be very powerful um are there any uh are there any was there any documentation of you performing it in the past um yeah we we record the performances but uh, um I haven't really done anything with the recordings. They're really rough because they're they're live recordings in the theater. Mm -hmm. so, but um, uh, you know, there's the possibility I could post synchronize them. I, I I haven't even really listened very closely to them. Yeah, it's it, it's it's a I I don't I think people a lot, many people know of Nosferatu, but I don't think most people think of it of the fact that it that it takes place during the plague. Yeah, and it puts a whole other spin on on its uh on its timeless quality you know why people are still watching it what year was it filmed uh 1927 wow wow um well i'm sure there will be uh more questions and i think there's going to be a very interesting conversation amongst the three of the four of us after everybody has um has uh, presented their work to us so maybe we will, I will move ahead and um, introduce Lenore and look forward to talking with everybody together uh, after um, we have heard uh, Lenore's reading. You're going to be doing a reading, Lenore? Yes. Uh, so Lenore uh, is the author of nine books, including the contemporary and historical novels, Water Woman, Ordinary Springs, Becky, the Raven's Bride, and series editor of the Night Bazaar Fantastic Fiction Anthologies. Her stories 
nonfiction and poetry have been published in magazines and literary journals. It seems appropriate uh, that she is going to be reading um, from, you're going to be reading from the Night Bazaar in Venice? Yes. Yeah, it just came out. It came out uh, two months ago. Oh, wow. Which is also set during the, the plague in 1348 Italy. Um, and, and, and miraculously it's come out. So kudos to you. Cause uh, I know it's, that's been a struggle for many writers. Mm -hmm. Um, Hart's been a visiting writer or artist in residence at Elizabethtown college, Flagler college, uh, Florida state, the Irish writers center, Norman Mailer center, George Mason university, old dominion university, the U S Naval Academy and the Oberfosser Kunstler house in Germany. Another place I've spent time. I love the, the Kunstler House in uh, Schwandorf. Um, a VCC fellow for two decades. She's also won awards and artist grants from the NEA, uh, the Virginia Commission for the Arts, the Florida Fine Arts Council, the Irish Writers Union, and the Connecticut Poetry Society. Her work's been featured by Voice of America, Poets and Writers, and the PBS series Writer to Writer. Hart teaches in the MFA program at Wilkes University in the Asabao Island Writers Retreat. Um, she's the, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, it, did I pronounce that correctly? Asabao? Asabao. It, 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 it's a, that's an, is that Canadian? Uh, Indian or Indian. Uh, Native American. I don't, I'm not sure which to say at this point. Um, it's part of the Barrier Islands chain in Georgia. Okay. It's just off Savannah. Oh, it's really good to know. Um, so I look forward to hearing you uh, read from the Night Bazaar, Lenore. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks for that introduction, Amy. Um, I'm going to read from the Night Bazaar because it's, it's my most recent work. It came out in August. And also because, uh, because of the plague theme, which was, of course, accidental. I, you know, I started planning the anthology at least two years ago, two and a half years ago. And um, I wanted to do this time, this is the second volume, I wanted to do the origin story of the Night Bazaar, which is the, the theme is always the same. There is a, an exotic traveling night market. It's run by uh, one woman who's the narrator for the whole collection each time um, named Vera. And that's my part that I write. I also sometimes write a story that I include and I did this time. Um, this time the anthology set in 1348 Venice uh, when the Black Death first arrived there um, as it moved through Europe. And so that's why I'm uh, also why I'm reading from it because that seemed appropriate. But um, also there are 12 other stories in the collection besides the one I'm going to be reading. Some of them are contemporary, some are historical because the time traveling nature of the bazaar, it appears in one city just once. It, um, it stays for seven days and then it never comes back again. And so all the stories are tied to the bazaar either by a person, place, object, or event that happened in the bazaar that's featured in that particular one. So this time it's 1348 Venice, the very first night bazaar. And my story is actually contemporary, but there is an object in it, a necklace with a pearl that came from the bazaar. So I'm going to read the first uh, several pages uh, just of my story, just the one story. Um, so I will do that now. And oh, also, this story was inspired by the Me Too movement and uh, the deep sea freediver Natalia Molchanova, two very disconnected things, but I put them together and that's where the story came from. It's titled Plenty of Fish in the Sea. I rise from the floor of the deep toward the faint quivering lamp glow of a full moon. Below lie the reefs, their phosphorescence faintly pulsing. A school of needlefish fin up madly in my wake, then flit past. The small fry fear I'll attract a larger predator, but barracuda and sharks always take care to avoid me. I swim with arms extended, a wedge to part the water. Body eelishly undulating, even through the strongest currents, to minimize the drag of this salt-infused sea. Layers of cold that hit other creatures like a heart-stopping ice bath, snatching away breath and warmth and life, are balm to me, for I can be just as sudden, just as cold. On the beach, I draw in a slow breath, letting oxygen fill my lungs, wincing at the acidic burn. Footprints crisscross the golden sand like trails in a forest without trees, the darker ones still damp with seawater. I'm already dry, save for the hem of my dress, which always stays wet, no matter how long I'm ashore. 
Smoothing creases from sea green silk, I stroll toward the tiki bar at the Blue Lagoon Suites. Its thatched patio overlooks beach and onyx waves, dark as an old bruise. A breeze bellies my skirt like a sail. Fiddler crabs flee to the safe, fragile safety of dune grass. On the patio, I brush sand from my soles and slip on silver sandals, then enter the bar, trailing a finger across the glass of the saltwater aquarium that runs its length. Clownfish, gobies, batfish, wrasses all freeze. Abandoning the single startled seahorse, whose tail is clamped around a branch of coral, they rush to huddle at the far end, mouths agape, thinning madly to stay in place. At a small round table, I sit and drape my skirt around pale, slender legs, tossing long black hair over one shoulder, hands resting on the glass tabletop. From a long bar crafted of bleached driftwood, a young woman in a white halter and short black skirt hurries up. Oh, welcome to the Cove Bar, she says breathlessly. What can I get for you? Hmm, let's see. So many different tastes and scents to savor up here. At last, I go with the usual. Beach plum margarita, please. She nods. Sea salt or sugar on the rim? Oh, salt, extra in fact, please. She weaves a ray gracefully between tables and I lean back to survey the room. Rough hewn pillars support the ubiquitous palm thatch roof, a giant version of the shacks land dwellers build in backyards to pretend they're vacationing on an island instead of working themselves to death to own that small patch of grass. This room is spacious though, paved with colorful Mexican tiles. 20 rattan tables hold wicker chairs like the one I'm sitting in. This late, the crowd has dwindled to the truly desperate and the truly intoxicated. The waitress sets my drink on a cardboard coaster printed with palm trees and flamingos. Thanks. I take a sip, licking salt crystals from my lips. Mmm, delicious. A plastic card materializes in my palm. She swipes it through a tiny machine pulled from the pocket of her apron, glancing at the embossed name before handing it back with two curling slips of paper. There you go, Miss uh, Morgan. Like a receipt? No, thanks. I scrawl a generous tip, then tuck my new card into a shark skin shoulder bag. You're welcome. The arm holding the round tray hangs relaxed at her side now. Are you uh, waiting for someone? Yes. I glance at her name tag. Shana? My green gaze holds her still long enough to see what's below the surface, a small room bright with sunlight, a shelf of books, a table with a bowl of apples, one slightly withered, a worn couch draped with an orange bedspread, one leg badly mended, two fist-sized holes in the plaster walls, and a bracelet of bruises around her wrist. I blink and lean back in my chair, letting go. She shakes herself, blushes, and takes a step back. Oh, well, um... She's clearly misunderstood my intentions, but no doubt she's hit on by people of all persuasions here every night. To put her at ease, I glance around. Uh, but I don't think he's here yet. It's true. She's, she certainly isn't who I've come for. Oh, Shana relaxes. Uh, hey, your hem's dripping. Do you want a towel? No, thanks. I may go waiting later. Well, let me know if you need anything else. She walks back to the bar, hips swaying, tall black heels clicking over the gleaming tiles. The shoes look hard-worn, one sole thinner than its mates, throwing her stride off, creating an imperceptible limp only a predator would notice. Whatever money Shana makes, she's not spending it on herself. A student working her way through college? A single mom who decided only she could love her baby well enough? A sick mother at home, perhaps? One thing I do know from those bruises and the quick dip into her soul, she's enthralled to a bad man. I lift my drink again. The lime juice is fresh. The tequila, best quality. I savor every tart, citric, salty sip. Only an inch of golden liquids left when an angry voice rises at the bar. A youngish man with blonde hair, dark stubble, and a faded golf shirt shoves his stool back and stomps to the waitress's station, where Shana is prepping an order. When he squeezes her bare upper arm, she jerks free, but the red imprints of hard fingers rise on the soft, smooth skin there, like stigmata. Stop it, she hisses. Derek, I'm working. No one else hears, or at least they don't react. The bartender is tall and broad-shouldered, about 40, with close-cropped curls and smooth, dark skin. His amber eyes are framed by sun creases, but he's at the far end, laughing tolerantly as a customer tells a long, rambling story he clearly hasn't heard. A couple, two stools down, are tangled around each other like fouled anchor lines, oblivious. 
I smile at their bliss, having known the sweet press of a lover's bruised lips too, in all my various forms. Still, the angry man isn't done. He follows Shana as she wipes tables, hanging back whenever she halts at one that's occupied. His cowardice, that hint of belly from too many beers past, they remind me of the red grouper. It fears bigger fish, darting out only to catch a fingerling, then hiding in its hole again to eat. Shana pauses before me. Refill? I nod and hand over the empty glass. Derek lurks three steps behind, scents rising off him in waves, stale barley, musky sweat, and something sharper, more metallic, the stink of meanness. Yet she doesn't tell him to go or ask her coworker to help eject him. So then I know what's to come will hurt her more, as human beings like to say. But what's good for us often feels more painful than whatever we foolishly desired instead. As she walks on, Derek grabs her arm again, holding it down between them so no one will see him give the wrist a vicious twist. She yelps and drops the bar towel. Hey, Shayna! The bartender opens the little gate and steps out, folding muscular arms. Everything okay? She waves him off. Fine, fine, Jeff. I just tripped. Jeff frowns, narrowing his eyes at Derek, but at last steps back behind the bar and continues polishing glasses, glancing their way occasionally. When I pressed the curved glass to my forehead, the one the bartender held while mixing my drink, there shimmered before me like sea mist, a young woman, his wife, a kind of wise woman? No, a teacher at home with a baby, a little girl they have hopes and dreams for. He is a good man. I'm glad I'll never need to visit him. Still, my feelings here aren't the point. This job is the family trade I was born into aeons ago. It's what we Morgans do. I rise and follow Shana and Derek, sidling past on my way to the bar, letting my breast brush his arm. To ensure he's hooked, I gaze back, catch his eye, and flash a crooked smile. At the bar, I fish a lime wedge from the metal garnish bin and suck on it, then turn and lean back on the polished wooden countertop, spine arched, elbows propped, displaying my considerable charms. Derek swaggers up, smirking. He leans beside me, gaze snagging like a fish hook on my low neckline. Stay in here? Hmm, I nod, just for tonight. He raises an eyebrow. Got plans? I peer up through a sweep of dark hair. Not yet. He scoots closer, glancing out toward the tables, making sure Shana's watching us. Well, why don't we get out of here? I mean, you and me. I shrug. I have another drink coming. And what about your uh, girlfriend? He snorts. She doesn't give a shit. Shana returns to the bar, head high, spots of color on each cheekbone. She impales a big green olive on a bamboo pick, as if it's my heart then plunks it into a martini the bartender hands across the rubber mat. Anger rolls off her in red and yellow bands that undulate like sargasso weed in a rip current. Good. The anger means she still wants things for herself, that she still has a self, hasn't completely disappeared beneath the demands of someone louder and meaner. Shan is like the red-tailed shark, quiet but watchful, defensive only when pushed. In a different life, we might have been friends. I'd like to walk over now and whisper, one day you'll thank me for this. To say, I know what's good for you and it's not him. Because over the centuries, I've seen endless schools of Derek's sorry kind swim past, have often ensured the past part myself. And then I tell her before turning away, there will be more, hopefully next time better, one who deserves you. Still, I come not in friendship, but with a sword. So I look back to Derek, smile and caress the luminous gray pearl that hangs from my silver neck chain. Hey, nice. He peers at it. Huh, looks old. A uh, present? When I nod, he turns wary. From your husband or I shake my head. No, from a pirate. He laughs cautiously as if he thinks I'm making fun of him. Isn't it strange how, when you do tell the truth, people tend not to believe it? I'll stop there. Wow. So it's funny how the stink of meanness really makes everyone want more, you know, uh, 
it, 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 we all have a taste for our favorite drink and your description really made me thirsty. <laughs> it, it was, uh, I have a feeling we would, we would have similar tastes at the bar, but maybe you're just really good at imagining. I don't know. I'm sure you are. Uh, um, that was, uh, wow. I, you know, I, I could just see it in my head. So thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Um, you. Have you, did you write it? Uh, have you been spent a lot of time in Venice where the stories t take place? I've been there once uh, about, I don't know, about five or six years ago. And I was, um, I was sick when I got there with something. Oh, I was getting pneumonia. That's right. So I was confined to the room part of the time. And then I went out finally. I couldn't stand it. And I had to go out and I got lost in the alleys and I was feverish and I was wandering around. And it was, I mean, that was great preparation <laughs> for the story collection. <laughs> so uh, some of the details I got from there um, and, and, but of course, you know, that's, that's in the other parts I write that are the introductions to the stories when I'm talking about Venice and the bazaar. So that I use for that. But of course this story is contemporary, so that's not in it, but I did get to use those aspects, the things that I saw in Venice when I write the introduction and an introduction for each story, a little introduction, and then there's a closing interest. So I got to use that in those particular parts. Wow. Uh, now it really left us all hanging. Uh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> and that it, it, uh, I could have just, you could have read, you know, for another 30 minutes and I wouldn't have noticed what time. <laughs> well, that's a high compliment. Uh, thank you. So, and, and, uh, uh, Thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, I really enjoyed your interpretation of it. Um, and I, I think that this is also a really good time for collections of stories mm -hmm. because it's sometimes it's hard to concentrate, to stick with something, even like those some some of the epic articles in mm -hmm. in the New York Times, because there's just we're just being bombarded with so much yeah. information uh, with everything that's going on. Yeah, there's a lot of anxiety and, and it's harder to concentrate for one stretch. I mean, I've noticed that I'm a writer and a reader, you know, and a teacher of writing, but I, I've noticed that, that you mentioned it. Yes. I'm having trouble sometimes too, which is, is odd to me, but then again, it makes sense when you think about the situation. Well, I, so it's, yeah, well, I, I love short stories. You know, I, 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 they are, um, they're a real discovery. You know, sometimes you don't expect to love them as much as you do, uh, <laughs> as well as those kind of novels that make you just not want to stop. Um, you know, because they just go on and create another universe. Um, so uh, you you actually asked some great questions of our other artists while they were making their presentations. So this this might be a, a really good time for us to have a conversation. I think we have a little bit of time, uh, uh, maybe five minutes, um, to uh, to kind of um, talk about each other's work. Um, so, uh, Lenore, uh, asked, uh, so you use a lot of, a lot of, uh, birds. you said ravens and, um, uh, in your work, in, um, in that particular series or other series. Cause that's, she asked Karen how, you know, you became interested in them. And I, I had no idea that these birds, um, what did they call the, 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 uh, Corpus? yes. I had no idea that they would have, they have funerals? Mm -hmm. They do, they prostrate and they, they gather together and often, you know, they're, they're really boisterous birds when they get together. And I have read and seen different scenarios in which they get together and they're silent and they prostrate and they gather around a dead crow and mm -hmm. do their thing. So there's acknowledgement of death there for sure. A lot more dignity than some people I can think of right now yeah. that are in the headlines. Yeah. Uh, I just, I had no idea. Um, so that's a theme that uh, s several of you uh, have. And uh, I think this idea of creating atmosphere, you know, all of the, the whether it's painting or um, your reading or uh, Jack's score, I think I really sensed an atmosphere that I could relate to. I'm not sure if it's an atmosphere that I would want to escape into or escape from, but I definitely <laughs> felt at, you know, atmosphere in all of them. And it was a good, a good escape from 
world, you know, but, but once you get there, it's like that dream. Some dreams you wake up from and you're happy and other dreams you're really sad that you, that you woke up. Um, and speaking of dreams, that's, that's what my dog is doing now. You know, she's snoring and, and, uh, and dreaming. And, uh, and so, uh, that's, that's the lucky 13 working over there. So, uh, no commentary on, she likes to be the center of attention. So now she's giving you all the center of attention. Mm -hmm. Um, what, so, uh, so do you want to talk about the atmosphere in your work a, a little bit? So Lenore, you went to Venice, you went to Venice and spent some time. And, uh, Jack, when were you introduced to Nosferatu? When were you inspired to, uh, to work with that character or that score? Or was it a commission? Uh, yeah, some theaters asked us to do it. Um, I had sort of um, needed the theaters to ask us to do it because of the theatrical rights are still being heavily watched and policed, so we would have to pay a rental to screen it. So, but the, the theaters were really right. It, I mean, all of the Nosferatu performances sold out, so it's turned out to be a really popular score. Um, and whenever you do it, the, the feats, the feet, the, the seats fill up. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. That's really exciting. And so when you perform, uh, for it, do you perform, is there, is there usually a, an orchestra pit or are you on the stage in front of the film while it's being projected on you? Yeah, we can't really be in front of the, in front of the screen because then people can't see the screen but most theaters that we play at have a small pit or an area in front and we'll block off the first row so we're kind of spread out all the way to the first row um and it it allows us uh, enough room and there's much craning of necks to see what's going on sometimes but it, but it works out okay well, I, I love live music as well. And, uh, and, and I also, you know, I, th I think that um, there's, a, there's a real, um, people really miss the kind of performance aspects of film, whether, it, you're, whether you're performing in front of a film or, or performing music to it or, or reading in an in a improvisational environment with a setup. I mean, Karen, you've done some installation work, yes? Mm. Yeah, I mean, not a, not a great deal of installation work, but a lot of times it's sculpture and drawings coming together. So it has a kind of combined sensibility of, you know, two dimensional and three dimensional work. Um, yeah. So, but that idea of atmosphere, I think is, is uh, I mean, so palpable, certainly in the work you played tonight, Jack and, and Lenore, that the atmosphere that you created in that that scene in the bar is just you know, I can, I can almost taste the lime that you're describing in that, you know, in that scene. But, um, but I think in, in, in my work, it ends up being just a kind of turbulence. I, I mean, that's how I think about it when I'm creating it, because it's, it's not, it's not directed by anything. It's just a kind of free form, uh, uh, just making marks and, and making you know, atmosphere. So, yeah. It's funny how the elements come together that way. You know, uh, Lenore, I'm sure you probably, uh, the, the places that you read, uh, are they, do they affect your, your reading, the, the way you respond to the work? You know, like, I don't know if, you know, different environments, a theater versus a library versus um, uh, something plain air. I don't know. Uh, I mean, the classroom, I think, is a place every that if you've done any teaching, I think everybody feels. Many people feel more, more. Um, well, it's it, it, there's there's a more more of a controllable environment, you know, that the, a predictable environment. Where whereas when we're performing live, well, anything can happen, and that's exciting, but also it's different. Yeah, I mean, we're live here, so anything can happen. But I guess it feels constraining in a way, I mean, to me, because um, I've done some acting. I, I also do some acting occasionally. And um, so when I'm when I'm live, you know, in the old days, live as in live in person, mm -hmm. um, 
I know I make a lot of gestures and, you know, use my body more and more expressions. And, but, but of course on zoom, you're in the little box, you know, and, and you're, you're holding your papers, you know, you don't have a, you know, it just, I mean, it's good. It's great that we're here and I'm, I'm glad we can do this, but I do miss that kind of freedom to, you know, act it out as well a bit, you know, use my voice and expressions and gestures more that, that makes the reading interesting too. I just, it feels weird if my hands are waving around on the screen. I don't think it's quite the same effect as it would be if I was, you know, on a stage in an auditorium. So, and yes, with teaching, I do, I'm a very gestury type person. So when I'm teaching or whatever, I think that's the thing I really miss about, you know, being on the screen as opposed to on a stage or in a bookstore. Well, I, I will say this. I don't, who knows what's going to happen with the pandemic um, or Tuesday, but I believe that, that artists, will have the highest percentage of enduring this and telling the tales on the other side, because I believe we are the most adaptable creatures mm -hmm. out of habit, out of necessity, because of, you know, who we are and what we do and regardless of our, of our medium. And um, so that, that really inspires me. And I, and I think that um, I've been inspired by like, this working this way as well as just hearing some of the concerts where people are performing from all over the world mm -hmm. or singing together or reading together from different places it's pretty uh that's at least one good thing that's come out of this you know that it's possible it's possible yeah. we're not stuck listening to canned reruns you know or whatever you know there are there are things that are evolving from all this that uh, did not exist before, not in the same way. Um, so uh, do you all have any questions you'd like to ask of each other? I think, oh, uh, Lenore asked you, uh, Jack, if, you, if you've if you read the novel uh, about Murnau by Jim Shepard. It's yeah, titled no, Nosferatu. I haven't, but I'll look for it. You should. I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, can I add something? I also meant to mention, although they're not here, that um, three other um, VCCA fellows have stories in my collection. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 And so applause for them, even yeah. though they're not here. Um, applause for you. Um, thank you. It's um, Aphrodite Anagnos, who is really Dr. Francis Williams, is a VCCA fellow. Also, Kaylee Jones, who's a novelist and memoir writer, and David Poyer, who's not just because he's my husband. <laughs> he's also been to the VCCA several times and he is a novelist and nonfiction writer. And all three of them have stories in this one. So I was pretty excited about that, that there were four of us. Well, that, that is, uh, I think that that, it's, it's just, I believe that one of the great things about, um, it's great to work and then it's also great to work in a place where what you do is understood by the tribe that you're surrounded by. Mm -hmm. You, you, you know, because a lot of people don't understand that about noise or are just our, our process. And, and I believe that that the community um, that we become part of at the VCCA is, uh, I don't know, it's, it, I think it's got a little bit of rocket fuel in it. Maybe it's something they put in the, in the food. I don't know. But there's something I think that there's something magic there. Um, yeah, I, mean, I always I always turn a corner creatively when I go there. Always. Mm -hmm. And it's always unexpected and it's always good. Yeah. And it really it's so conducive to uh just uh, allowing me to relax enough to delve into things that I wouldn't otherwise. So yeah, thank God yeah. for the VCCA. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the time. The time is priceless. I, I actually began work on this particular book, the editing work of all the stories, you know, while I was in um, Schwandorf at the Oberfelser Kunstler House. And then I finished up my final edit in January, this past January, at the BCCA in Amherst. So, I mean, gosh, what would I have done otherwise, you know? I'd have had to run away. I don't know. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah, it, that is a particularly great place for quiet it is it is extremely quiet and uh when i was there the first time i've been twice the first time 
the, I didn't know that, that everything was going to be in German, everything, all of the television, <laughs> everything is in German. For the first week, all I had to read were old time magazines, you know, from like a few years <laughs> old. It was very interesting. I, and I, I brought books with me from the library, you know, from the, I think from the airport, but I read them all in, in a, very quickly. And it, it was, so it would be a great place to work on a novel. And I did make a lot of artwork there. Mm -hmm. uh, or editing or whatever. Uh, so, so Jack, how did you first hear about the BCCA? Uh, I don't, I don't remember. I, I know the first time I went was in 2009. Um, and I, I just had a, a great experience. And then I went back in uh, 2012. And I, it, it's just such a great in, environment because you're, you kind of have this peace and this headspace where you can just focus on what you're doing. I do remember applying, and this happened both times, and this may, I don't know if this happens with everybody, but I get the feeling it happens a lot with composers where you're like, oh, I'm going to go there, I'm going to work on this project. I have this thing that I'm doing, and you have this proposal, and then you actually go there, and you end up working on something completely different. <laughs> Um, Absolutely. But I found that was really good because I found that when I was there, you were like, you have this freedom and this mental space and you're like, oh, well, this is really what I should be working on because this is, this is what I'm doing. Absolutely. Uh, I first heard about the VCCA uh, when I was at a, on my sab sabbatical and I was at the Cité des Arts in Paris, and my neighbor there, um, in, in, the, in the studio next to me, had just had been at the VCCA for I don't know months, and she said it just it just changed her life, uh, and changed her work in a very profound way, and and I thought that was very odd that that's the first person I'd ever met that had spoke so highly of it. I knew about it because I was teaching in, in uh, Virginia, but. I guess I always thought of it as being as related to where I was working. You know, I never thought about it being a place where, where artists and composers and writers from all over the world and the United States gather. So um, that was that was an epiphany for me, and uh, and and, it, and that and then so many other reasons. Um, so um, so it, it is a soon. It will. It will be. It will. We'll cross our fingers, and uh, you know I'm going to be referring to my many uh, spells and uh, and potions behind me in my library of magic. Uh, get us through uh, to uh, good things to the other side of uh, of at least Tuesday, and let's all uh, stay well and uh, continue with uh, with uh, our hoping. Uh, preparing, what, what is the expression? Uh, hoping for the best, but preparing for the worst. Yeah. And for me, that's when I love to, that's when I really go to the studio. So um, I hope this is going to continue to be a very prolific time for you um, uh, as we get to the other side of this, all of you. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for uh, sharing your work with us. Um, thank all of the viewers who logged in tonight and remind everybody, um, if you're interested in becoming more involved with the VCCA uh, to apply for a residency or to become involved with the Fellows Council, please visit their website, vcca.com. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Stay well. Bye. Bye. Bye.